Odile, ça a commencé apparemment. Ok, euh, merci beaucoup Leïla. Euh, Jacques, euh, je, je vous laisse euh, la parole pour expliquer le, le fonctionnement et l'interprétation. Give the floor for the instructions regarding interpreting. So, for interpreting, click on the icon of the globe if you're on a computer. And if you're on another device, you have to click on the three dots at the top right. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar. If you wish to follow the webinar in English or in any other language, you are free to do so by clicking on the little globe uh, interpretation uh, where you will be able to find the interpretation to English, French, Portuguese and Spanish. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Donc, and that's uh, it for the technical instructions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's start the webinar. I'm really delighted to welcome you to this webinar. We're going to talk about the European perspectives uh, for uh, hail riding drivers, platform drivers. This is organized by Leila Shaibi and also by uh, the union, the trade union INV. This is a first, a world first. We are very lucky to welcome here representatives from nine different countries the world over and uh, they will uh, take the floor during the three hours uh, that are dedicated to this webinar. We'd like to uh, warmly thank our Australian colleagues who have accepted to uh, go to bed very late uh, and uh, the uh, uh, colleagues from the Americas who have accepted to get up very early. So thank you for the flexibility. So before giving the floor to Leila, I'm going to uh, tell you uh, how this webinar is going to be structured. First of all, we're going to have an introduction. The introduction uh, is, uh, the webinar is going to be introduced by Leila Shaibi and Brahim Ben Ali. Then we're going to give the floor to the representatives uh, uh, of drivers, as I said, drivers from nine countries the world over, and they will tell us about the uh, national issues, international issues, European issues to take stock. And then we are going to uh, have a closer look at the situation in uh, Europe with representatives of ETAC and uh, also with the uh, Confederation of uh, the European unions as well as uh, MEPs. And then uh, we'll have questions and answers, and uh, we'll hope that the Q&A will help us to uh, think collectively about all these issues and what's going on in Europe at the moment. Leila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Odile. A warm welcome to all of you. It is uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce this event. This is a first drivers from uh, all around the world uh, will engage in a discussion between themselves. Uh, they come from the UK, from Spain, uh, from Belgium, uh, from Australia, from Ecuador, from Colombia, from Nigeria, from the US, and of course, last but not least, from France. So this is um, quite an event and something that uh, may be unexpected for the uh, hail riding app drivers. Now, uh, this uh, goes counter to the strategies of the hail riding apps, but because what they want is a transnational extension, something uh, that uh, operates with complete disregard of uh, national law. And beyond that uh, transnational strategy, there is also an attempt to optimize the exploitation of workers because workers are isolated. They don't necessarily talk between themselves and so they are more likely to accept working conditions. Everything in the, the way uh, platforms are organized uh, is actually designed to prevent drivers to talk 
to each other. They are uh, driving in the car. They are isolated. They have an individual contract with the platform. They uh, speak different languages, so there is the uh, language barrier. Despite all of this, the hail riding drivers or the platform drivers have managed to organize themselves collectively. And that is putting pressure on the legislator. There are some victories. What's also really interesting is uh, that uh, the uh, workers are now organizing themselves internationally. Workers for digital platforms and hail riding app drivers. Now, this is very important in order to put pressure on the employer. This webinar will be a landmark. Uh, workers have already mobilized. You may remember that uh, a few weeks ago, a number of drivers met in front of uh, the European Parliament in order to protest against uh, a possible legislation. There was also the Forum of Alternatives to Uberization. And uh, there were workers for Uber, workers for Deliveroo, and other food delivery apps. And so we really do hope that this transnational mobilization is going to bear some fruit. We also hope to organize another one in September. Now, all of this is actually creating dynamics that are in our favor, power dynamics. Now, the European Union is has started designing a directive. Now, a directive is something that is implemented in national law in the European Union. But once there is European legislation, it's going to have an influence the world over. Now, this directive is going to determine what the status of platform drivers is. Now, mobilization like the one we have today is something that is will enable the workers to make their voice heard and also create uh, positive power dynamics. I'm thinking here of Uber and others who are lobbying the European Union to try to impose their views. Um, this, uh, you may remind the Proposition 22 in California in the US, and uh, they are just trying to influence the law in order for it to be more advantageous. A number of courts say that Uber is operating outside of the law, that it is illegal to claim that the workers are independent without giving them the tools of being truly independent. So the courts are telling Uber that uh, it is operating outside the law. So either we adapt the law so that to suit Uber or we force Uber to comply with the law. I've worked with a number of uh, colleagues uh, to uh, draft uh, directive uh, that will give uh, the platform drivers uh, the same rights as employees. And what we're doing today is going to help us put pressure on the employers and to uh, shift the balance in our favor. Now, it is my great pleasure to coordinate this event uh, with Odile Chani, who represents the network sharers and workers. I'd like also to uh, thank uh, the union that is uh, hosting us in, uh, on its premises. And of course, it is a great pleasure to uh, uh, co-moderate the webinar with Brahim Ben Ali, who has played such a crucial role in mobilizing the uh, high rating apps. So uh, he represents uh, the main organization representing uh, platform drivers. And so without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Brahim. Thank you very much. This is Shaibi. And it is a great pleasure to see you at this event today. Now, let me tell you about uh, our daily work. Some actually died at, at work while pursuing a dream of independence. Liberalization has created social dependency and uh, digital slavery. Liberalization means making every entrepreneur believe that they're autonomous, but at the end, uh, you feel the consequences on your health and your well-being. This is why we need to apply pressure on all our governments in order to create uh, a new structure that prevents the uh, multinationals uh, to make profit at our expense. 
What is at stake is the compliance with labor law. For a number of years, we have tried to find something in order to prevent this rampant threat that is urbanization. Now, the question is, is it possible to build together something that will protect our rights and our health? And the answer is yes, because the, these uh, digital colonizers uh, have applied increasing pressure. They have extended the market shares in every aspect of transport. So it has been market share grabbing. Uber represents now 20% of the market share. It is an invader. It is a colonizer. It is a structure that uh, wants to implement complete dependence. And that is something that is reminiscent of video games. It is about competing for the best turnover. And in a way, the best form of slavery is when the slave is convinced that it is for his or her own good. This leads to tragic conflicts. One driver, for example, was cleaning his car while the other was obsessed with um, making a quick buck. And this led to a conflict, a fight between the two men. What the driver, when telling a story, says that he doesn't even understand himself with hindsight why he was angry. So, uh, yes, he was tired, uh, he was actually exhausted. And uh, this is the consequence of uh, this uh, new form of slavery. The uh, companies play with our lives, our well being, but we have no way of fighting back except collective mobilizing. We need to regulate digital platforms. It is the only way in order to fight for our rights and to unify the defense of our own interests. This is the only way forward, the only way to make sure that everyone's rights are respected. With this future European directive, it will become clear what is at stake when it comes to recognizing our rights, or on the contrary, it will be the funeral of our rights. I am very happy to be together with you today with this world webinar. This is a historic landmark. This is something that we will remember as a moment where we fought for our rights. Malcolm X said famously, you cannot, you can only gain your freedom when you show the enemy that you're ready to fight till the end. End of quote. Thank you very much, Brian. I think, thank you both, Leila and Brahim. I think that uh, the context now is uh, very clear that everyone knows what this is about. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, uh, um, to start with the first part of a webinar. And uh, I'd like now to uh, give the floor to Asmin from uh, the uh, UK trade, un trade Union. Yasin has actually, uh, uh, been a key witness uh, for the great victory at the Supreme Court at the UK. And I think that we can start a discussion and he's going to tell us about what is going on in the UK. Thank you very much. Yasin, you have the floor. Four minutes, please. Four minutes. I'm sure that in four minutes, you will be able to give us your best and tell us all about the situation where you are in the UK. Thank you. Yasin, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Firstly, I just want to say thank you to Ibrahim uh, for inviting me. Uh, he's been a good comrade, even though I'm in a different country. Um, and it's all about, as he mentioned, it's about solidarity. And uh, one of the things about Uber is all about isolating drivers. And it's clearly like we working with drivers in Paris shows that that isolation uh, doesn't exist no more. So we have workers organizing regardless of what country um, they are. And I started my journey uh, in organizing drivers back in 2000 and 14 and we filed the first case against uber here in the uk in 2015 along with a few other drivers now you know we went through various stages like we won in the initial court the tribunal we then won in the appeal tribunal we then won in the high court and uber dragged it all the way up to supreme court so it's a six years you know like difficult lengthy battle just to fight for basic employment rights. Now, 
one of the biggest problems for us guys was we're average workers, you know, and if you look at the workers that work for Uber here in the UK, a lot of them, majority, in fact, are from the BME community, which means black, Asian, minority uh, communities. And Uber heavily rely on these kind of workers because they know they are desperate. They know that it's easy to exploit these workers. And the problem we had is the law, especially in the UK, United Kingdom, they exist. But what we found in my case is we get companies like Uber where they could afford not to obey the law because they have the money to challenge this. Like, for example, in my case, they were able to drag it for six years because they were able to do that. But one of the other problems we have is lack of enforcement. So, for example, in uh, London alone, we have a regulator called Transport for London. So they, I would say personally that there's a failure of regulation yeah, against, um, um, you know, like failure of enforcement. So, for example, this in February, we won a landmark case. And this was the first ever case for the gig economy in the UK where uh, we were able to assert our rights and get. So as of today, drivers in the UK are now getting 12% you know, uh, holiday pay, and they also get in 3% p uh, pension. You know, this is like a small victory for us, but the Supreme Court ruled that we are workers from the time we log on to the time we log off. But unfortunately, Uber is only willing to pay drivers when they're uh, with the passenger. So clearly, they're not willing to respect the ruling of the Supreme Court. And initially, when we won in February um, this year, Uber immediately made an announcement saying that the ruling only applies to 25 claimants that were part of the case. So you could see how Uber works. But my, my point here is, look, you know, we need tougher regulations. And the problem we have is, as part of ADCU, Uprise and Courier's Union, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take on this worker status, which we already won, and we want the working time clear. But at the same time, you know, we have filed a case in Amsterdam and what we believe is Uber is hiding behind technology. It's very important that globally, especially around European with the uh, laws around Amsterdam where Uber holds this data, it's important we have this transparency. But it shouldn't be down to the workers to be fighting for that, whether it's uh, Ibrahim in uh, Paris, whether it's uh, Deborah in Australia. You know, the regulator need to step up. And they need to do their bit in making sure that one, for example, when we talk about Uber as a technology company, it's very important that workers have access to transparency. Yeah. Secondly, they should have the right to object to how the data is being used. And if you look at New York, uh, for example, the regulator there, TLC, they were able to push Uber to release this data. You know, and it shouldn't be, like I said, it shouldn't be workers going through a lengthy battle again and again in court. So this is where we need laws. I mean, I, in fact, I don't say we need new laws, like even in our case, like the case, let's just talk about the worker status. The laws exist for years, but there was lack of enforcement. And even now, once we won, oh, the politician here in the UK are talking about new laws, but no one is talking about enforcement of these existing laws. So we have the same problem here with the data side like we have the ico that you know looks into the data side but they're not really doing a job of um, regulating but i just want to like um just thanks Layla because you know i wish we had politicians like her in the united kingdom that are actually standing for workers um and that is a key element so you know um ibrahim is lucky to have someone like um you know Layla and politicians that are more supportive so that's my key message my message would be is, look you know we are fighting we're fighting we're doing everything to take on uber the main thing about uber is trying to isolate people and that isolation have broken and since we won against uber at the supreme court our membership has gone up like we never seen it surge and we're in fact struggling to deal with the new sign up of membership you know so people are no longer afraid and we're getting bigger and bigger every day but the problem is now for us guys is the regulators uh, and making sure those laws are being enforced and those needs to be done by someone else, someone else needs to take over and make sure that bit is being dealt with. But I think I've gone over my time, uh, but thank you once again, yeah. Merci, merci beaucoup, Yassine. Uh, effectivement, enfin, qui, qui donne un, un thank you very much, Yassine. It gives indeed a quite clear 
other side of the British situation and it clearly echoes the stakes of that fight for the directive. I'll give the floor now to Tito Alvarez of, of the Edit Taxi uh, Trade Union. It originated uh, uh, to a, it was at the origin of a landmark regulation in the area of uh, people's transportation. You have the floor, Tito, for four minutes. Okay, okay, I'll put the taximeter here to count. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And then we're now talking about historical things, but I think there's something historical. Someone from the taxis is here in this event right now. I think this is already uh, something we have won because one of the victories of these platforms is to fight against uh, workers. And I think regardless, we are a taxi men or we come from the TAC, I think we need the same respect. And this is something we have managed to do in the platforms. And we are happy because of this, because we are here defending the rights of workers. But we know that in order to be able to defend their workers, things have to be organized and we need to have boundaries. In Barcelona here, we are in an association which gathers the metropolitan area of Barcelona. This is a famous taxi, the cab, which is black and yellow, and we have 10,521 licenses. So imagine all the things we need to do because Uber, we manage Uber not to be here because we just told them not to be here. We were able to tell them they couldn't operate in our area. So I think the first thing we have to do is to create an alternative amongst workers and we don't have to work with them. And it's very hard whenever they are already within our fabric, in our market, and they are already there and they have some place. But it's never too late because we went before the European court and we denounced them. And we were just taking money and we were in the streets, in the taxi stops and asking for money to people to contribute. And thanks to that, we got enough money to go against court. And we won that. And they told us that this was not collaborative, collaborative economy, that this is a transport company and they had to comply with the law in every country as anyone so now i think that for this new directive what we should do is to set the boundaries the limits but at the same time we should ask our politicians to give us an alternative publicly this way we should have some guarantees about all these rights and everything into taxes because what they do is they hide this with the technology and they pay taxes in tax havens. Thanks to this, they get their power and then they have this dominant position and they use it in order to not comply with the law and to go against the small ones. So I think that the first ones to be accountable here are the politicians, the public powers, because they are the ones who should give to users and to citizens an alternative that ensures all these guarantees. And at the same time, we can do all the things in a private level. I think it's very important that the European Union, together with politicians, stop serving financial powers. They have to create legislation without gaps because these platforms take advantage of the gaps. They have this unlimited power and they just do anything they have to in order not to comply with the norms. From our side, workers, we have to do many things too. We have been working in two, for two years already internationally with the whole Europe, with California, with different people. And today here we are talking about drivers, but we should also talk about riders because at the end of the day, we are all in the same situation. Amazon workers, for instance, we are an international war, uh, network. We have to gather and we are not going to exclude anyone it doesn't matter if you are in California working for Uber or being a rider. We should all go together. And after this meeting, we should keep working together. And in case we do that, we should keep sharing information because at the end of the day, we are going to be able to fight against these platforms because they don't think we are going to go forward. And this is our key element to work together, to respect each other. And thanks to that, 
we won't allow them to keep winning. I, mean, I could be talking here for hours about different measures, different things we have done, but I think that taxi and TAC are two different services. I think that technology just came here to make everything easier for some of them and things got mixed. And at the end of the day, we are just making workers poorer. Workers are fighting once against others. And I think what we have to do is just stay in our place and work each one in our place and keep doing. Here in Barcelona, we are creating a public app for taxis. It would be free for taxi drivers. And I think this is very good news. It would probably be one of the first ones in Europe. And I think we have to foster these public free services in the whole Europe. We also have hackers here. We have two hackers who are paid. I mean, we are paying them in our staff and they are working in reverse engineering against Uber and Cabify and so on. And we have seen that they are violating fundamental rights. I don't know if you're aware of that, but one of those applications, when you get too connected to a Wi-Fi, they get into the whole Wi-Fi and they steal all the data of all mobiles connected to the Wi-Fi. So they take that, the, that data and they send the data to Delaware, to their servers. And this is something criminal. We should treat them as criminals because this is what they are. I mean, I could be talking here, as I said, for hours, but you can count on us. We want to finish with them. And here in Barcelona, we have a lot of power of mobilizing people. And if we are talking to fight against platforms, we will always be there wherever you ask us to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tito. And indeed, we are raising the European uh, stakes uh, through this first round uh, of um, interventions, contributions. Thank you very much for sharing your um, contributions because it will feed into the questions of the second part of the webinar. Now, if you don't mind, uh, let's go to Belgium uh, in our grand European tour with ASMA from the um, trade union of limousine drivers in Belgium. I give you the floor to explain your situation in Belgium and also give us your take on what's happening at the European level. Hello, everyone. And thank you very much, Odile. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'll also use my time app to make sure that I respect the time that was given to me. And I will uh, give you uh, another side of the current situation in Belgium. The situation is really complicated. In Belgium, taxis are suing the Uber company. Dozens of taxi drivers decided to go to court against Uber. A ruling had been given in 2017. It was partly in favor of Uber and its drivers, but they appealed. And the Court of Appeal dismantled the whole system used by Uber in order to work with um, private cars in Belgium and limousines because in Brussels, they uh, use the LVC system, a uh, car uh, hire with a driver. They have a contract and it has been deemed to be fraudulent by the Court of Appeal. That decision, however, is not definitive because the Court of Appeal asked two questions to the Constitutional Court on that same legislation of a car hire with a driver. In the current situation, uh, Uber drivers are completely illegal. They keep on working because they have no other option. They need to make ends meet. 
controls were carried out after the uh, decision of the Court of Appeal. And uh, as a result, um, well, police uh, decided to act and um, the car, as a consequence, uh, the drivers could face the forfeiture of the cars and they could be withdrawn of the license, deprived of the license. In fact, the drivers are the only targets. They are risking it all by working for that uh, company, for that platform. We organized a big demonstration in support of those drivers. The minister in charge of the issue in Brussels promised to reform the sector maybe uh, by uh, creating more un uniformity in the sector by increasing the quotas and uh, creating more uniformity in the sector to make sure that everyone can have some work. But it's going to take time and in the meantime uh, drivers are clearly worried, they are frightened um if they have if they are fined they will have to pay that fine themselves because the agreement used by uber with the drivers unfortunately does not respect the law uh, for that industry because in all sector of limousines, we need to have at least three hours contracts for a minimum amount of 19 euros. You cannot use emitters and receivers in your vehicles. These are the two um, violations of the law that uh, trigger a warning by the enforcement authorities when there is a control of those drivers. We do hope that the Minister President of the uh, Brussels Capital Region will be able to reform it all, will be able to set new rules that are fair to everyone and that can um, apply in the whole region in Belgium. We are now expecting what will happen and we are also expecting what will be the future of those uh, platform and especially in brussels thank you very much asma because it clearly shows how difficult it is to uh, have uh, stakeholders with uh, different rules if they do not have to abide by the same rule it creates of course uh, new issues no if you don't mind let's move to equator where well, we will take stock of the situation in that uh, country and uh, of course the issues are really similar this is the reason why we wanted to organize a global webinar so raul you have the floor to uh, give us your take on the stakes in your country at the national level on those uh, on the situation of drivers raul you have the floor Hello, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon in Europe. Good morning, America. My name is Raúl. I'm not saying my real name because I wouldn't like to, to, to suffer from the platform because I have been working for Uber for three years and a half. Um, I drive for them. I would like to show my experience. And I think that Ecuador has a similar situation to other Latin American countries. We are poor countries. There is hunger. We have a lot of needs. And then we finish by being below these kind of applications and these kind of companies, and we accept any kind of job because we are being precarized. We are kind of modern slaves. We are talking about Uber, Drive In, Cabify, Global, Rapid, amongst others. So they are taking advantage of the political moments and the pandemic. Um, they try to find their so-called cooperative partners who are, at the end of the day, slaves, and they use this to get richer. They are technological unicorns, and they just try to get advantage on themselves. 
in Ecuador, there is a lack of employment, we are very poor, and in different areas, different workers, engineers, clerk, workers, doctors, they finished by doing these kind of activities. And they are using their own means. They are using their cars, their motorcycles, and they are even sometimes risking their own lives for doing this kind of job. We are working with no protection from the government or from the municipality at all. We are not acknowledged as workers. We do not have a salary, no social security or benefits or maternity leave or holidays, etc. We're just there because they take advantage of us, of our need, of our desire of just moving forward and doing something. And we are behind the wheel and we are just working without having lunch, without going to the toilet, without cleaning ourselves. We are just working hours and hours and we are being exposed. And there are police controls, there is violence, criminality, and we have uh, the application, the company, the authorities, the, the, the police forces, we are just at their expense. And Uber is not legalized in Ecuador as in other parts of the world. So if it does not exist, who can protect, protect us against it? I just hope that with events as one we are just holding now, we will be able to shift things and the platforms will give us a real job opportunity, protected as workers, as human beings, because we need this job in order to survive. We need to be acknowledged before local authorities because we are doing efforts just to move forward and we should join forces in order to get recognized, acknowledged as real workers. With the pandemic, we are just completely abandoned. We are facing many more risks because we can get COVID, we can be assaulted, there can be many problems. And we are trying to move people in order to have in Guayaquil or Quito, in Ecuador, in our cities, some mobilization to have people moving because there is a huge risk of using public transport. But who is paying for our medicine, for our doctors? No one. And we need to have our labor rights as drivers. And that's what we intend to have thanks to this kind of acts. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Odile, Leila. Thanks to all. Merci beaucoup, uh, Raoul. Uh, Thank you very much, Raoul. It shows clearly the importance of increasing in the uh, protection of workers wherever that is uh, in the world. Now, if you don't mind, let's move to IUID Ibrahim. You are from Nigeria and co-founder of the National Union of Professional App-Based Workers Trade Union. And you can indeed uh, talk about the situation in your country, where it is uh, quite interesting. Uh, the developments are interesting. Several people are talking at the same time um uber increased its rates uh it is important to cut the microphone of the uh, speaker that uh should not be speaking so you could talk about the situation in africa you have the floor thank you very much uh, my name is comrade Ayadi Ibrahim from nigeria uh, our situation in nigeria is not different to the rest of the world uh, Iba came to Nigeria, especially Iba came to Lagos in 2014, and the business is booming. By then, we we we, we have money to our business, and uh, our business is booming. And uh, in 2015, the Nigeria Lagos market is more than London market by then. But in 2016, uh, Uber cut down our income by 40 percent, and that's the beginning of the problem to the driver in Nigeria. So since then, our money has been reducing day by day, minute by minute. And uh, in 2016, uh, both Tazify, 
launched in, in Nigeria too, in, two, in 2016. And by then, the concern of every driver in, in Lagos is, we have been dealing with individualists. That's why I bring all the drivers together in the street of Lagos, street of Abuja, for us to form a body. In, 20, in, 26, in 2017, 2018, we'll form a body, National Union Professional Air Based uh, Transport Worker here in Nigeria, which is still on the process of uh, permission from the Minister of Labor and Probability here in Nigeria. So since then, our, our, our member has subjected like enslaved. They work more than labor law hours. They work 16 hours. Here in Nigeria, it's supposed to work for eight hours and half a break of one hour. Um, it's not happening in the platform of Uber and Boat here in Nigeria. So most of the driver have fatigue. During that fatigue, they have an accident. We lost more than 2,500 driver from 2014 to this present time in the platform of uh, Uber and Boat. Uh, we lost about 1,000 to the accident, and then we lost about 1,500 to the uh, Ambroba and the unprofiled riders. Rider is our customer here in Nigeria, but the, the platform did not profile them. And uh, the argument they tell us is that they want them to, you know, easily to access to their platform so that they can make a request faster, which is endangered driver here in Nigeria. Another problem is issue of regulation. There's no any regulation that, um, you know, caution them here in Nigeria. They have a free will here in Nigeria. In fact, in 2020, the Lagos state government accused Uber and both of not to pay the, the, the tax they're supposed to have paid for the uh, Lagos state government by then. See, now as I'm talking to you, uh, there's no really regulation here in Nigeria. Another problem is the misclassifications. Uh, they call us driver partners here in Nigeria. But if you look at the reality on ground, they treat us like workers or slaves. Because if you call us a driver partner, we're supposed to have input on the pricing mechanism, the commission you take from my own business, and uh, the rules and regulation that guide the business. But they will tell us we are entrepreneurship, you are on your own, you are this, you are that. Meanwhile, on the paper, they call us like that, just like a slave, or like 2016 to this present time. Uh, are you a day? And the, 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 the problem. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, there seems to be a problem for, for the uh, translators to. Uh, understand you so maybe uh, you can try to speak a bit uh, slower what on essaye the connection peut-être après on essaye encore ou je m'adresse aux interprètes OK très bien merci beaucoup Ibrahim peut-être uh, vous pouvez synthétiser uh, Ibrahim uh, uh, okay. okay, la connexion est très mauvaise, manifestement. Uh. Can I continue? Okay. Can I go on? Okay. As I already said, our, our problem here in Nigeria mm. is not different with what is happening in UK, in US, Ecuador, every part of the world. That's why we are, when we saw the, the judgment in UK and we are motivated by it, and uh, we are trying as much as possible uh, to take them to court here in Nigeria so that we can have access to every right that we need to have to, according to the uh, Nigeria constitutions. And uh, if you watch what is going on in Nigeria, is this is the same thing that is going on in Ghana, in Kenya, in South Africa, in Uganda, because we let talk within ourselves. We talk to ourselves. So the, the, the platform 
do not regard us for anything and uh, they treat us like the slaves. We, we, we protest last two weeks and what it did is to unilaterally increase price on their own. That's why the fact they increase the price is not commensurate with our income. And these are the gimmick they normally use so that they will have the sympathy of rider with his customers that we are trying to tell them to increase the price against the customer. So just to get sympathy with them. Technology supposed to be an advantage to us. But this technology they introduce is like they introduce slave trade to us. Because things will have easy if, if to say they follow the rule and regulations. They do not allow unionism on their platform. They do not allow collective bargaining on their platform. They prefer to deal with individualism, which it cannot help our situation on ground. So these are the major issues, especially the issue of revolution and allow us to have labor rights in their platform. These are the challenges that we are battling with Mais, them. Are you ready? Thank you, Adi. Thank you very much. The interpreters actually uh, can't hear you very well because your bandwidth, your bandwidth is not very good. It is not very strong. So, because of uh, uh, the quality of the internet connection, uh, it has been uh, difficult to follow you. And we hope, uh, please feel free to chime in anytime down the road and to try again. Maybe your connection will be better in a little while. And I'm really, really sorry to take the floor away from you, but thank you very much for the insight you gave us about the situation in Nigeria. So, so far, what have we heard? We have heard what the situation is at um, the uh, national, an international level. And what we also noticed in what you said is that uh, several of you mentioned the uh, what's at stake at the European level. I suggest that we now turn our attention towards the um, directive that uh, uh, that is being designed at present, European directive, and to open the um, second part of this webinar. What we'd like to hear about is what you, as professionals, expect from the future directive. So, Yasin, I would suggest to give you the floor again. Yasin, it would be really interesting to hear from you what is at stake and what we should keep particular attention to. Yasin, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, hi there. Um, thank you again. Yeah, no, I just want to say, I mean, it's good to hear um, the stuff. And like everyone already said, the issue we have are the same. And what we have is these greedy companies like Uber, who have unlimited money and resources. And it's not easy for average worker, the people that they rely on to exploit. It's not easy for them to go up and fight. Yes, the workers are fighting and they are resisting and they're doing a great job in order to resist and winning campaign but we need more and what i mean by more is we need politicians and people that have influence in making these regulations is forcing uber 
and the like of Uber to obey the law. So we could talk about all these new regulation and we could bring in new regulation. But the problem is if Uber would still decide not to obey these laws, what good are or what's the point of having these new laws? So my priority would be is you know and what i would urge everyone on what we need to do or and it's not just uk this is around the european union is we need to make sure that when we talk about these regulations existing laws or whether they're new laws we need to think about how do we enforce them and what happens like for example let's say we bring up a new law that you can't exploit workers and workers should be given their basic right and if companies such as Uber decide they don't want to obey the law, what is the punishment for them? And this is, and it's like I said, and I'm referring to my experience here in the UK, where Uber clearly, you know, don't want to obey the law and they could afford not to obey the law. And it's just easy for, you know, everyone to sit back and let the workers fight. And that can't go on. Uh, and we've seen this in California where because of, the lobbying power and the resources Uber have, they can, you know, launch these big, massive, you know, PR and uh, campaigns, you know, to mislead people, which the workers don't have. But what we do have is people, and we have brilliant politicians like Leila and people. But the point is, how do we enforce the law? Forget about organizing for a minute. How do we get Uber and company to obey the law? And that is the problem here. They are, in many cases, failing to obey the law. Um, and this is not just unique to Europe. Like, we see this in different places. And this is a giant, and that's how the model is based around. It's all about looking at these loopholes within the law, how to exploit, like, look at, like, you know, how to wiggle around them, yeah? So it's the same in our case here in the UK, the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the land and respected by many countries, actually looked at the whole working arrangement and they were able to see that, look, this was a sham setup. They deliberately set it up in a way to exploit these employment loopholes to evade tax and make sure workers are denied the rights. And the very same workers that they knew don't have the resources or access to justice. Now, in my case, I was lucky that uh, we had some great lawyers that come forward uh, and supported us and we were able to fight with the support of the drivers uh, and the community around us. But that's not the ideal situation for the workers. And even like I mentioned earlier on when I spoke, like we won in Supreme Court, but even as of today, Uber is not 100% compliant of what we won. And, and the next thing for us is, you know, when we talk about these technology companies, they're hiding behind these algorithms. And over the coming years, we're going to see more and more of that, like the discrimination element, the way, like everything is getting hidden. But how do we bring that transparency open? How do we make sure like everyone, like, you know, like the point is, there's so many things that, uh, and even like Ibrahim, for example, like in France, I see like, uh, and recently with the Barcelona case where they won against, um, you know, um, a lot of the uh, control element but where is the enforcement and that is the element missing the workers can't enforce the workers could go out there run campaigns uh protest and that they're doing a great job at the moment but we need to see more enforcement at the government level which is failing and what i'm seeing is it's not just around here in um you it's happening a lot all over but that's all for me thank you Merci beaucoup, Yacine. C'est vrai qu'effectivement, Thank you very much, Yacine. Yeah, that's something that we haven't talked about yet. Or at least uh, not yet. Yes, enforcement, law enforcement, uh, and for example, the role uh, of uh, um, the uh, authorities for labor law enforcement is something that's absolutely key in order to counter the abuse uh, carried out by platforms. And this question of law enforcement is crucial. I think that um, this is something that will certainly speak to Leila, uh, Ludovic, uh, or Natalia. And uh, would you like to take the floor, maybe, 
Leila, would you like to react to what Yasin has just said? Certainly, certainly. Can you hear me? Well, thank you very much, Yassine. Yassine, yes, you're absolutely right. You have uh, very well defined what is at stake. The work on a future European directive is, uh, is it going to be something that uh, will force Uber to comply with the law or is it simply going to be a law that is going to uh, adjust the law to suit Uber. The courts are saying that Uber is uh, outside the law, but uh, and for a long time that uh, suited the uh, lobbyists working for Uber or for Deliveroo. But this situation has changed. The status quo is now uh, coming to an end because the courts are increasingly saying that the, this is placing them, making them outlaws. So what they want, because the status quo is no longer viable to legalize a situation that uh, has been deemed illegal. So you're right, Yassin. The uh, directive proposal of the draft directive is, is something, if the European institutions are working for the collective interest, is not to create uh, extra rights, no, what is really uh, at stake is to make sure that at a European le level, labor law says clearly, states clearly that uh, platform workers should benefit from the same rights as any other worker. When there is a relationship of subordination, then they should have uh, access to uh, uh, social uh, benefits. And if they are truly independent, uh, then uh, the platform uh, with uh, which they're working, they cannot be controlled by the platform. So yeah, you're right. Maybe what is at stake is not to uh, invent an alternate status, but simply to make sure that at European level, those rights are enshrined. Thank you very much, Leila. Would uh, other participants like to take the floor and to uh, react to what's just been said and the issues that have been raised? So um, I don't see any hand raised. Uh, Tito. Could you please tell us what you expect from the future European directive and in particular when it comes to uh, uh, the workers' status and also to the informant enforcement of their rights? We know that uh, in many cases subordination is uh, uh, established beyond doubt. And Brian, if you want to take the floor after Tito. Tito, you have the floor if you wish to. Okay. Ahora. Bueno, yo creo que eh, aquí en Barcelona... Eh, uh, I think that situation in Barcelona is that we have created lots of regulations, of norms, a lot of legislation. So thanks to all this legislation, we have guaranteed that they comply a part of it. Today, in the Council of Ministers, a new law has been approved. It's not the law we were really willing to have, but they are kind of uh, deleting the bogus, auto bogus um, workers, self-employed. What we want to do is to have Uber as an employer, because they have to do things as employers, because the other people there, they are just paying for the social security, they have no social protection, and they are not recognized or acknowledged in any sense. And Uber, they just disconnect and they say it has nothing to do with them. So we cannot allow that. If there is a company which is managing things and they have a power on the worker and they tell them how they have to work. And they are the ones that are getting the money from the users or the clients. And they are the ones 
paying the drivers of the workers. They are the one imposing the rules. So they are the employers. We cannot say that the others are self-employed. They are workers. So today there is a new law which has been approved in Spain and this right is recognized. Labor inspection has already obliged to have thousands of drivers as workers. They are not bogus self-employed anymore. Now there is like a three month period so that everything has to be regularized. And we could take a look at this new law and repeat it in Europe in other places. And this can be linked to the directive. I'm not sure about how we can guarantee that laws are complied with. I mean, I'm listening to you and I have been listening to the same things for so many years since I've been fighting platforms. I think it seems to be impossible to make someone to comply with the law. So that's why I insisted so much about the responsibility of public powers, public personalities, they have to provide tools to these companies. Because I'm listening to our colleague from London here, and they have this ruling, and it was so important. And something similar happened to us in 2017, and it appeared in all the media. But then we see that they have not changed anything. They do not comply with the law. So why do we want the law for if we are not able to enforce it? It doesn't make much sense, but I don't have the solution myself. So, well, that's why Leila is here and all the politicians and the technicians and everyone who has uh, the, the, the chance and the, the power to, to find a solution. I think that, for instance, if a platform, platform wants to operate, it has to comply with legislation at European level, legislation, I'm talking here about labor law, about tax laws, they have to pay taxes in the country where they do have their activity. And if they don't comply with that, maybe we couldn't allow them to operate. And we have to find a solution before it happens, not just to have a law so they can take years to do whatever they want. And when they have to pay for the sanction or the fine, they just don't care because they are already multimillionaires and they have just paid taxes in tax havens and they are hiding money as they do. Because we know what happens in, in the stock market, but it doesn't matter because they have so much money and they're just you know, putting money because they are rich. So personally, I don't know what is the solution, what the solution is, but I know that workers, we have to organize ourselves and not only to claim these rights within the platforms, we also should create alternatives. And we should tell the citizens that this alternative does comply with all the rights for the workers, with everything they want to have. And we do things that they don't. So this way we will also raise awareness towards public powers so that everyone will try to use a fair trade and to support the smaller ones and to feel obliged of creating this circular economy, which has a real impact on the small commerce and retailers and some responsible consuming, all these things. This has to be done both by public powers and public authorities and by workers, because I think we are also an, uh, guilty about this because we are just saying we want to fight against a platform that is exploiting us but this is not so easy of course but there are many alternatives they can do other things besides mm, ex mm, exploiting workers and the thing is that every time they get more into a monopoly and they have more power but we need to find a solution to be able to work with them for instance in barcelona uber in the last two months, they have opened their own application for taxis. And no one was able to take 
a taxi from Uber and they are making their promotion and they were trying to do that, but citizens are not able to use it. Why? Because the taxis, they say, no, uh, you don't have to use Uber. You have to take us, real taxis. So there is a way to go around. And I think that there is more life beyond Uber. We need to raise awareness and the citizens need to prefer real taxis and real things. And at the end of the day, this will be positive for everyone, for the well-being, um, for all the society. It's hard to do it because they have so much money to their communication campaigns and so on. But we should do things and we should get into a block in order not to allow them to fight us so much because we don't remember what happened some months ago. We were just applauding when there was a pandemic and we were all thinking about the doctors, but now they have just opened and finished with the state of alarm and we are all out in the streets and we don't remember the doctors anymore. And this is how we act. We are humans and this is our way of doing things. So here with this directive, we should try to change things. We should try to make them comply because otherwise they will just keep doing as they do. They don't care about sanctions or penalties. It's nothing if we compare it to the benefit they obtain if they keep doing as they wish to do. And that's a key element, I think. Or otherwise, we have to organize workers and to try to give an alternative to them. That's all. Thank you very much, Tito. This was very, very interesting. And thanks for reminding us uh, that uh, the best way of law enforcement is uh, to actually have a robust legal framework. And uh, you also reminded us of the need uh, to reach out to the general public and to uh, raise their awareness of what is at stake. This uh, webinar is being recorded and it will be uh, posted on the, the social on social networks. So I hope this uh, will contribute to the awareness raising. I'm now giving the, f giving the floor to Brahim and then Angela. Brahim's sound makes it impossible. The sound seems to be stabilizing. In France, we had actually uh, referred a number of cases to uh, the law enforcement agency of labor law. Uh, there, what is also at stake is uh, this brain sound uh, makes it oh, near impossible. There is a lot of echo, says the moderator. So what I was talking about is uh, about uh, the uh, difficulty of the work and the consequences on uh, our health. And uh, the uh, inspection, uh, the labor law enforcement agency tells us that, uh, yes, we're absolutely right. And this has at first effects on our health, uh, but that actually enforcement is not possible. Then there you go. The speaker's sound is still of very poor quality. So this person from uh, the uh, inspectory body, Brian, I'm really sorry, but there is a terrible echo, says Odile. Can you hear me better now? I'm really sorry for interrupting. Well, I think it's because, uh, can you hear me now? I think it is better, says Odile. So, oh. so the situation in France is um, actually conducive to having new legislation at the European level, because it seems like uh, we have um, used all uh, the venues for action that are possible in France. So f year after year, we have been told that there will be no change with the current government. And so this is why we started uh, sh uh, thinking that uh, new legislation at the European level would be the way forward. Now, the protection and uh, labor law uh, 
is better in other European countries. So harmonizing and improving for everyone is the way forward. Once again, it is impossible to claim that we are independent workers. We clearly are in a situation where uh, we are not independent. Labor law is, uh, in France at least, uh, not up to date and uh, not ready to take into account those new uh, situations. And when updating the law, we will be able to take situations to court uh, who will then say that no, we are not independent. Whereas in the current situation, there is some level of confusion or leeway for interpretation. And then there's also, there are provocations. So sometimes we're being told, uh, well, unionize because uh, the law will not be enforced if you don't mobilize, which is, if when you think about it, completely unbelievable. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, what Leila Shaibi is uh, uh, suggesting at a European level is really the only way forward for us. And so this will actually harmonize the situation of labor law for all workers in the European Union. And I think that it will also make give official recognition to platform workers at a European level, which will make it impossible for member states to hide behind the legislative, legislative jungle. In France, Uber is being left in peace. And so uh, I admire what is being done in uh, Spain. So we cannot go further on our own. Some said that, uh, it, Yassine said that compliance was really the main issue. But I think that actually there is also a legislative way forward because we need to denounce the hypocrisy of member states who are hiding behind the disparity of the legislative framework. Thank you very much, Brahim. This was uh, very enlightening, and it actually uh, taught us very clearly what you expect and what your union is expecting from uh, legislative progress. I would like to give the floor uh, to Angela Fogel, uh, Angela, uh, Philadelphia Writers in Philadelphia. We are very, very happy that you were able to join us for this uh, European webinar. and. Um, we are very happy to hear you speak about uh, the issues at stake in Europe. You have the floor, Angela. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is a, a really fantastic panel. I feel a little out of place um, because uh, the US is not the great example of freedom that many Americans like to imagine we are. Um, we have freedom for corporations like Uber, uh, but in fact, we have very few laws to prevent the exploitation of workers. Um, I would like to uh, agree with my comrade Yassine um, that it, it will not do any good to pass new laws, whether in the US or in the EU, um, if, you, if the legislators who are passing these laws are not fully committed to enforcing those laws, uh, to seeing them through after they're passed uh, to enforcement. Um, what app dispatched drivers around the world need from the EU um, is to set the standard for enforcement uh, of workers' rights. Uh, I should say, especially data rights. Um, the EU does uh, have much better uh, data rights uh, than the US and many other countries around the world. Uh, we, uh, the Uberization of work has convinced us all that algorithms are superior to humans as managers, uh, but they are not. Uh, Profit-driven injustices and discrimination are enforced by algorithmic manipulation. If I steal $100 from you, I would probably end up in jail but Uber can steal our wages and our data with no consequences whatsoever. Uh, they aren't treated like criminals when they steal from us. Uh, so we workers who are managed and manipulated uh, by these algorithmic bosses uh, really do need for the European Union to enforce driver's rights 
to algorithmic transparency. Uh, we need to know how, how they are manipulating us and fully understand how they are exploiting us uh, so that we can support legislators uh, like Layla to enforce uh, either the rights that we already have or, or any new rights um, that you may guarantee for, for drivers in the European Union. Uh, that is all I will say. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and hello again from Pennsylvania, United States. Thank you very much, Angela. And this is actually uh, a wonderful segue into the third part of this uh, webinar. You mentioned the uh, protection of uh, data and uh, what has been done uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, there have been initiatives, uh, there is a new legislative framework. I'm sure that we're going to discuss these issues later on, but it would be maybe useful now to hear from you about the transnational issues. Uh, what about intermediaries? What about uh, the key players regarding uh, the uh, uh, algorithmic management, uh, the transparency of uh, data crunching, etc. And so uh, I would suggest giving Brahim the floor. I know that you care about these issues. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. And the sound quality of the speaker is appalling for the interpreters. We are doing our best. Uh, everything starts with a starting point, legislation. There are associations that are specialized in data collections. We need to imagine that it is an empty box and um, uh, algorithm use data. So what we saw is that we use the application we have to tried see what to understand was what is going on. How can we feed that box? Uh, we use all smartphones. Because uh, the way and, algorithms work uh, know, is something that is important, not just for the workers, what, uh, but also have to do for the customers. Smartphones. If uh, so, we have a customer uh, requiring have customers, um, uh, then uh, the lift, we need to uh, have relevant data drivers. is going to be uh, sent to 10, to 20 make or sure 30 that drivers. It is uh, working properly. And of so, course, um, those uh, 10, uh, 20, uh, 30 drivers will be uh, left to the site. But of course, in order to satisfy uh, the needs of the customer, uh, they need actually these uh, uh, numbers of drivers that would be left to the site. And uh, we have uh, talked to, to other platform workers in order to try and understand uh, what was going on. I'm sorry, the uh, says uh, Brahim, he is trying to adjust. Is the sound better? The speaker is asking, is the sound now better? When using the uh, application, uh, we saw a number of uh, problems. The sound of the speaker is really bad. The interpreter apologizes. So the application is based on the matching of profiles because that is how you get some seamless running. So the technologies uh, are there, they are available. And so we were really wondering why in order to match they needed such a high number of uh, drivers that would just be on standby. 
why actually try to have the highest possible number of drivers when in fact there is absolutely no need for that so this shows really uh, that beyond a certain limit there is absolutely no sense so the scale of numbers that are being used uh, is something that uh, points towards an intention of the company because collecting data of course has its own value so it is not even operational it is actually something that goes beyond in our investigations we found out that uh, roundtables were organized uh, where drivers uh, were being uh, uh, invited uh, in order to uh, develop loyalty to the brand so what i'm trying to see here is that we really need to treat the problem at the level of data collection regarding data we have seen that uh, angela told us angela told us about uh, uh, the uh, uh, problems in the united states but when we uh, actually uh, contacted the law enforcement agency in France that told us that nothing could be done, except that when we referred the case to the uh, uh, highest instance, uh, the state council, then suddenly they uh, actually started showing interest in the topic. So transparency here and knowing how the data is collected is really a key step in order to enforce our rights. Peter was right. We really need to better understand the mechanism. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Brahim. I realized that, uh, Raoul, you also wanted to take the floor on the European stakes. So, Raoul, please uh, have the floor and then we can move on. And please accept my apologies. I forgot, completely forgot to give you the floor on those uh, European stakes and because it is so valuable to have your um, take on the European situation. You have the floor, Raoul. Thank you. Thank you again. The effects of digital platforms are the same anywhere. These companies operate in a similar way. They exploit their workers, quote unquote workers. Raoul, are you listening to a radio station or the television? It's probably because of that uh, we cannot. Is it better now? Sí. Mucho mejor. Es mucho mejor. Muchas gracias. Le micro, Raúl. Your microphone, Raúl. Please unmute yourself. It's better now, right? Great. As I said, the effects of digital platforms are the same everywhere in the world. What they do is precarize the work of their collaborators or quote unquote workers. They try to benefit from smaller countries due to the legal framework that they have because they are beneficial for them. For example, Latin America, with a very high poverty index, has seen how with these platforms, the acceptance by drivers regarding low salaries has increased too. We can also see what the reactions are by these legally created companies. The drivers have lower wages 
and thus they have to carry out a social struggle to defend their rights. We have seen what's happened in the UK, certain cities in the United States, in Colombia, for example, there has been a struggle to regularize drivers from platforms under a fair and equitable legal framework. We need to acknowledge that Uber drivers are human beings. We need social protection, we need health, we need food. We have seen what's happened in the UK, in the US. We have seen struggles for years and we want to struggle too. However, we have seen labor and political retaliation against us and this has prevented us from acting. We need to have access to retirement, to food, to social services. You are just illustrating this example with what you are doing at the European Union. And this is a very important example for us, what you are doing regarding the algorithms, because we, as I said, need to be acknowledged as human beings. We are hungry, we are thirsty, we need social services, we need basic services. We are being exploited. However, we are continuously exposed to very high risks to retaliation as soon as we start struggling. So from Ecuador and from Latin America in general, we hope that Europe will continue struggling. We continue defending us just like we have seen in the United Kingdom before. Workers need to be defended. In New York, in Mexico, for example, these drivers are already recognized, but in Latin America, this is not the case. So I would just like to say that we need to continue struggling. We need to continue working hand in hand in order to be acknowledged as human beings by the algorithms and by the companies. Thank you very much for being an example. Thank you very much for letting me speak once again. Thank you. And I will be very attentive to what's happening in the European Union. Well, thank you to you, Raoul. So without further ado, let's move on to the international stakes. Asma, I know that you clearly want to take the floor on that. You want to bring your contributions and then we can have an exchange of views. Please raise your hand if you want to comment. And then we will move on to the second part of a webinar. Asma, you have the floor. Thank you. I wanted to clarify one point. All over the world, there are multinationals. They are working with self-employed all over the world. Uber or other companies, applications, are not the first companies to work with self-employed in all the industries that is happening. I was myself self-employed with another company in another industry and clearly, unfortunately, the conditions are not really good. Whatever the relationship you have with the uh, companies, uh, when you have a relationship between a self-employed and a company. So clearly, this is a gap when a self-employed has to work for a company. Big, company have been, big companies have been using self-employed all over the world and for a while now. We need to ensure that there is a framework though. We need to install, to adopt legislations, regulations in Europe and in all affected countries in order to protect those self-employed people because they are workers. If they choose to be self-employed, we cannot deprive them of that choice. In Belgium, all the drivers partnering with the apps want to stay self-employed, want to remain free of being self-employed. They do not want to become employees. They want to uh, keep their self-employed status, but they want respect 
respect for their work, respect for their entrepreneurship, because some drivers have real fleets of several cars. They are uh, in partnership with those platforms and they need to respect those drivers, those self-employed people, respect their work as well and be uh, real genuine partners. This is what we are requesting in Belgium. It's not the first time I mention my own case. It's not the first time I'm a self-employed. The problem is the relationships that uh, there is uh, uh, in the society with self-employed, the manner in which self-employed are perceived. And then another point, if you allow, there will be new apps in the future. They will be uh, present in all countries and therefore we will need to reform laws at the European level. This is why I support Leila Shabi as well as Brian, because I know that we need to act. We need to create a framework for those companies to operate. Thank you very much, Asma. Tito, you raised your hand and Angela, of course, if you want to bounce back on those issues, feel free to do so, including on the international stakes. Please raise the hand and I will give back the floor to you. Thank you. I would like to respond to what Asma has just mentioned. We would all like to be able to choose, but I think that we are wrong in this regard. It is very difficult to force these platforms to respect our rights. So any loophole that they have, they will take advantage of. And we need to be clear regarding what we want to be. A worker that works for a company as a driver for example, in my opinion, is not an entrepreneur, is not self-employed, is a worker for a company. And the same applies to a rider with a bike. They may want to be self-employed or entrepreneurs, but they are working for a company. An entrepreneur is something completely different. A self-employed person is something completely different. And we need to be clear regarding all of these concepts and the difference between them. Otherwise, we will not be able to fight for our rights and struggle. Those of us who are workers need to fight to improve our working conditions. However, self-employed people may want to decrease their social protection just to increase their workload. They may not have access to the same level of social protection, of social benefits. We all have to pay taxes to be able to share our wealth. Of course, this is done through taxes. However, for us, the model of platform workers cannot be the same as self-employed workers. Because otherwise, we are not clear in this regard. We have to know what these concepts are. And for example, the relationship between workers and the companies they work for and self-employed people and their clients is not the same. So self-employed cannot be a way to precarize employment and to decrease social rights. So sometimes it's better to decrease our workload, but increase our social protection. Ideally, we would be able to choose. Of course, that applies to any situation. Ideally, we should be able to choose. But that free freedom makes us slaves to a, to a reality that actually does not exist. Unfortunately, when we ask the company to comply with the law, we also have to comply with the law. We have to fulfill our, duty, our duties as workers. And I'm talking about this case specifically. 
And now regarding data protection, I will send this to Leila so that she can have it, but we have carried out three studies with a hacker. We have applied reverse engineering to the Uber app. And I believe that in the European directive, it's important to take into consideration the small print of the Uber app. I'm not sure why Uber needs to be able to access my audio files or my text messages or many of the data that have nothing to do with the activities that Uber is offering or providing. And this harms everyone. Does anybody read the small print when we download a new app? I'm not afraid to say that I never read that small print. I accept automatically, and I know that that way I am giving access to my data, to that app or to that company. And uh, I know that in the small print, they include a waiver, for example, that makes it impossible to make them liable if there is if there is a problem and they need to take responsibility they need to be liable if there is a problem so that's something i believe that we need to insist on when we download the uber app we can see that there are many things including the small print that just don't make any sense. They say that they are an intermediary, that they are not a company employing people, and that way they are not liable for any problem that that may be. They don't have any responsibilities, they don't have any duties to fulfill. However, if I am self-employed and I have a car accident, I am liable, not the company. Uber is not liable, but I am liable. That just doesn't make any sense. We are workers in this case. We are workers. We are not self-employed. So Uber should be liable, not the workers. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tito. Thank you for your contribution. It will raise the many comments from our European panelists. Uh, please, Angela, you can have the floor. And then uh, Yassine and then Brahim. Thank you. <clears throat> I hope I'm able to organize my thoughts about this well enough for you all to understand. Uh, no matter what language we speak or what religion we practice or who our president is, uh, we workers, uh, we drivers around the world are not so different from each other. Um, our experience of exploitation is the same in every country. Um, Yes, workers here in the US, like elsewhere, want flexibility and freedom in how and when we work, but needing freedom so that we can prioritize our health and our families is not mutually exclusive to fair and safe working conditions. Uh, it is our responsibility to educate and inform our fellow workers that we can have both that we are owed both flexibility and safe and fair working conditions. Um, and here in the US, uh, that is one of our biggest struggles is fighting the propaganda um, of the companies like Uber that tries to tell workers that we have to choose one or the other, either safe and flexible working conditions, um, or fair working conditions when we are entitled to both. Um, as I said before, and I think other speakers have also said, uh, the fact that we are managed by algorithms tends to uh, obscure how little freedom and independence we actually have. Uh, recently, a court in Pennsylvania that said that yes, we are employees and not independent contractors uh, this, our state Supreme Court pointed out that truly the only freedom that we have is the freedom to log off of the app. And all other freedoms that companies like Uber claim that we have don't really exist. They are just manipulated by um, an algorithm. Uh, like uh, legislators in the EU, uh, 
legislators here in the United States do also frequently question whether or not existing labor law actually applies to us. Uh, so our challenge is, is not so different in showing these legislators that in fact, uh, the existing labor law does apply to us. And the fact that we are managed by an algorithm, you know, does not fundamentally change our relationship to our employer. Uh, only that it is uh, an, a, an app on a cell phone telling us what to do rather than um, a human. <clears throat> so when we see legislators in the EU uh, take a stand to create uh, labor laws that will ensure that we have both flexibility and safety and fair working conditions, uh, it sets an example that we can encourage our legislators here in the United States to follow. So I want to thank you for setting that example. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Angela, pour uh, votre témoignage et uh, effectivement interpellé sur uh, l'importance qu'il y a uh, Thank you very much, Angela, for what you just said. And uh, this, uh, once again, brings our attention to the algorithms and uh, the interference with labor law. Yes, Ian, I think that you uh, raised the hand to ask for the floor. You have the floor. Okay. Um, yeah, no, just um, I wanted to say a few things, but I think Angela covered it and so did Theo. So it just, you know, actually confirmed that we all think like uh, it's the same issue. Uh, one of the things I just want to clarify, in the UK, we have three employment status. So what we have is, and which is unique here in the UK, so we have like a self-employment where you're truly self-employed, you're in charge of your own business, you run it the way you want. And then right at the bottom, we have like an employee status where you're employees, so you have a lot of rights. For example, you get paternity, you get holiday pay, you get sick pay, you have the right to unfair dismissal, pension, all those other benefits, so your P PAY, and there's a control element over you, but you're employed. But what we have in the UK is a middle status, which they call a limby workers. Now, that's what we won in the Supreme Court. So we were limbies workers. What limby workers mean is you're self-employed, but you're actually running someone else's business. So um, like in our case, we're actually running Uber's business, but we're self-employed in some element where we have some, you know, uh, freedom. But at the same time, there is an element of control. And therefore, as a worker, we're entitled to basic rights. So the basic right that we're entitled to under the law is one, the right to earn the minimum wage. And that's after your expenses. Uh, number two is holiday pay. Uh, and number three is uh, the right not to be discriminated against and like whistleblowing protection or trade union recognition. So that's all you get as a worker. Now, this is something that we filed in 2015. But, you know, at that time, things were a lot different. I didn't understand what collective bargaining was. You know, I didn't understand what unions was, you know, as an average worker. So all this stuff I learned over time. Now, looking at the model today, we don't need this middle status, yeah? And it's very often, and what Angela and TU said, I'm sort of repeating it uh, again, is, you know, they sort of make it out like you're self-employed. You're your own boss, you're the partner. Uh, and one of the things that they sell to you is the flexibility. And that's what it's hidden about. They say, like, they scare you off. So you go to trade your flexibility over your rights, which the law entitles you. I mean, a worker should not be put in that position, but that is the position we're put in. And just to give you the facts and the figures here from London is, and this is before the pandemic, we done a research with all our drivers and we looked at the figures. An average driver works about 70 hours a week. Seven zero, yeah, that's 70 hours a week. Now with Uber drivers, they need to work 35 hours just to offset their expenses. So what that means is they have to work 35 hours before they make any money because they have fuel to pay for like petrol. They have to pay for their cars, they have to pay for the insurance and all that kind of stuff. You know, so, you know, so the point is, yes, you have flexibility with Uber. You could log on whenever you want, but it means you're working every hour and that is not the quality of life. So, even though we have this worker status, and if I was to challenge this today, 
I would get rid of that middle status. You're either an employee or you're truly self-employed. So you run your business. It's your business. You know, uh, the way Tio said, it's your, you know, like you're, you're the entrepreneur. You do what you want. It's your business. Or you're an employee. And what that means is you have this protection, like Angela mentioned, like you need uh, health uh, and insurance and all that kind of protection. You know, because these are vulnerable workers, people that are making below minimum wage. They need uh, uh, that kind of protection. And you only get that if you're an employee. Again, like we're seeing a lot of drivers getting deactivated from the platform. And what we can't do is we can't challenge the unfair dismissal. And that is wrong because a lot of this is hidden back uh, behind the algorithm and the way they program it. Yeah. And what we saw seen quite recently where Uber lost their license by uh, Transport for London. So they refused, to, uh, they weren't allowed to operate. So they had to appeal it. So they were forced in a way by the regulator to push, uh, bring in these um, things like, for example, um, a facial recognition. So they agreed to set up this um, facial recognition so when drivers log in they can monitor drivers and all these surveillance stuff that they did in order to please the regulators but there were flaws in the system so for example uh, we had drivers trying to log on to uber app trying to work but the facial recognition because it's an automated process it would fail to recognize them so what would happen is uber would then block their app they would then report them to the regulator like transport for uh, london on the accusation that they are sharing their apps so a driver has not just lost his job at uber he also lost his license so therefore like in the case like i mentioned his name like imran he was not able to work for six months with no source of income because there was an error made by a computer and and when we started looking into this uh, and it, the system is actually used by my, uh, provided by microsoft even microsoft themselves admitted that there's a problem with this system especially to do with people of color and women's so you got people's livelihood on the line and this technology is doing harm and it's not just about them losing the job they're then being, being reported to the regulator who are then treating them like criminals and they have no source of income and then they have to go into court to win their license back with no money yeah um you know the system is all rigged and so it's important like you can't have these automated posts where people are being kicked off and just recently uh we managed to get a default judgment uh for six uh, drivers five of them were from uk in amsterdam and and it is all about they were deactivated for fraudulent activity like fraudulent use but they never committed no fraud it was a system and the way they programmed the system to do it uh, so we uh, and uber didn't want to challenge it they hid in the background and they did everything to stay away from it because they didn't want to expose what was really happening but for me and as a union guy we had five of our members that suffered for six months with no source of income and now we we managed to get three of the guys their license back from transport for london in court which cost the union money uh, um to do but you know, it can't be right because it was all done by errors, by these algorithms, you know. So we need to see transparency, but there also needs to be uh, some kind of punishment. We need to look at the harm it's doing to the workers. Because like I said, you got six guys who potentially had, well, who didn't have no source of income for a mistake made by a computer. And all Uber's going to do is hide away. So, you know, we got all these um, big issues, you know, um, and we could talk about these employment laws and all that. But what we're seeing more and more is this surveillance and the way um, companies such as Uber are hiding behind this technology. So it's very important to crack it open and have, you know, um, real transparency because the damage done, we, we won't hear about it because these are people that no one knows about. You know? So this is where it needs to be pushed more harder um, by regulators, making sure that there is some kind of collective bargaining that involves data on the table. So it makes it a, a workers' life a lot easier if we have that data ourselves, so we could sort of do it. And like I said again, we don't need uh, a middle status 
you know, you should be either self-employed or employee, and we shouldn't be trading off our flexibility. I mean, even now working for Uber, uh, that flexibility as an employee shouldn't change because you're there to do a job and you do your job, you earn your money and you should be entitled to what the law uh, or your human rights, basic human rights are. Okay, that's it. Merci Yassine, je pense qu'effectivement c'est le message sur le troisième statut est très clair. Thank you very much Yassine. I think that uh, your opinion on the alternate status, the limbi status is extremely clear and unambiguous. So thank you for that. If you allow me, I'd like to speed things up because uh, the third part of our webinar, uh, we should have started with the third part of our webinar. And so I'd like to give the floor to uh, Tito, Brahim and Ayoade. And uh, I will give you the floor for questions and answers uh, later on because we are already behind schedule. So let's proceed as I just said, please. My apologies, I know I speak a lot. I completely agree with Jacin, with what he has just said and his argument. I think that one of the most important things to create this transnational network is to learn from each other. Because sometimes we want to be something for instance, in London or in the United States, they have already done things and we want to be as they were. And what happened when they had this intermediary status in the middle? It happens what Yassine has just told us. So maybe we should just learn from that and see what has happened abroad and not to commit the same errors and to just fall into a lie. I completely agree with what you have just said. We are either self-employed or employees. If you are self-employed, you have some rights and you also have some, uh, so, sorry, employee, you have some rights and also some duties. And there is no midterm when you work for something as Uber, because whenever there is a midterm, they will just take advantage and they will violate all your rights. And you will just be exploited. And on the second hand, I would like to share this research for the directive. What we have done is with Cabify, with the driver app, we have analyzed their data, we have treated the data, and we have seen how, for instance, if I use as a user Cabify, I get uh, some points, some stars for uh, giving stars to the driver. But if I'm in a computer, I can change that stars. So when there is someone who is driving, they need to have a minimum number of stars, quality of services and stars given by the client and minimum hours of working and that kind of things. But you cannot only count someone is working since, uh, you, you have to count it since the moment the person is does log in, not just when they are driving. And whenever you are doing things and rating and doing these kind of things in the app, even if you are not driving, you are also working. And we are using this also before the court here in Spain because we are winning rulings. I mean, you are working all the time. You are doing something for the app or the company. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tito. Are you ready? I will give you the floor later on for the uh, questions and answers. We're now welcoming uh, Kim van Spanentag from the European Parliament. Uh, you are very welcome here with us at this webinar. We're very happy to see you at this webinar. And uh, we are really looking forward to uh, your contribution for this third part. Brian, the floor is yours. So, There was a lot of media frenzy around the decision of the Supreme Court uh, in the UK. But when you look at the detail, and uh, I'd still like to congratulate uh, Yassine, I mean, uh, that was really incredible what you achieved, incredible victory. So when you look at this uh, Limby status, you are neither an independent worker nor an employee. But allow me to uh, summarize it just in a word. We are disposable workers. 
we are just disposable. We uh, kill ourselves working and we are just uh, meat for the platforms. I'm, uh, I like being independent, but that kind of independence is not really being independent. Uh, I'm just going to take about my own experience to be disconnected simply because in the uh, terms and conditions, uh, uh, they uh, state that uh, if uh, you have a, a defamatory attitude or you slander, well, for example, I asked what this slander, how slander was defined. And what I was being told is, as soon as you basically open your mouth to protest something that is unfair, then suddenly it's qualified as slander and you're out. So recently there was a driver with the highest possible marks. I mean, she, she had incredible ratings and she was disconnected from one day to the next. And when she spoke to the media, uh, everyone thought that this was a mistake. I mean, this was an excellent driver and this driver had been disconnected despite her incredible achievements, doing her utmost to uh, do the greatest possible work. So to be independent should really mean that we're able to set our own prices, that we can work when we see fit to work. What I find really scary about the situation today in France is that uh, France is a member state where the situation is particularly complicated. I went to the labor ministry recently. The labor ministry is supposed to stand for the rights of workers. And I've been told that despite the recognition of uh, our uh, highest court on the 4th of March, uh, there is still some wiggle way that uh, the fact that we can disconnect when we want from the platform is guaranteeing our freedom. The platform is um, uh, actually, I mean, I do, if we push it a step further, we're going to actually uh, work for free. And so I think that the European directive uh, is the only way to actually put some clarity in uh, all the member states. and. To me, it's really important that we work hand in hand across borders. For the coming year, we really need to apply pressure and to uh, campaign in favor of the clarity of our status. We have, are either independent workers or we are salaried, but we cannot stay in this uh, in-between limbo. We have seen drivers drop dead, literally drop dead because they're working 14 to 17 hours a day. And the promises made by Uber are lies. There are uh, false promises. In France, when you look at uh, employees, uh, Uber is of course not compliant. So the whole thing is based on lies and on false promises. I think that uh, the decision that we need to take here today is to really put an end to this uh, situation. And please, please do support the next step, uh, uh, the design of European legislation. We're very lucky to have Lila Shebi, who is working hard on bringing about European legislation. This would be a very important signal sent to the entire world. Thank you very much, Brian. I think this uh, segues beautifully and before we listen to uh, Natalia, I suggest uh, that we'll look uh, at a short clip which will explain to you how the legislative process at European level will work. There is no sound.
Les eurodéputés se réunissent pour négocier. Les députés se réunissent en ordre de négocier ensemble un rapport de proposal, qui est à peu près la position du Parlement européen sur l'urbanisation. Leila Chabiri représente son groupe de gauche et elle a déjà drafté un rapport européen. La Union européenne doit être inspirée par ça. Step 2. Le comité d'emploiement et de social affaires du Parlement européen vote le rapport. Si c'est approuvé, il peut être voté dans le Parlement de plénière where all the MEPs take part, step three. But it's not the end. Step four, the European Commission publishes a directive proposal. Step five, two parallel actions. Uh, Labour ministers of the 27 countries of the EU gather to talk about the proposal. In parallel, MEPs uh, gather to, to, to talk about the proposal. Leila Shabi is in charge of that work. The positions of the different institutions are merged. And then the directive is approved. Each country of the European Union, including France, will have to apply apply that directive. The work at the European Parliament is of the utmost importance. It will have an impact on the lives of all workers in digital platforms. I feel motivated. We need to support MEPs fighting to preserve a stable and safe employment. Right. It is a very good start of our second part of the meeting today. And uh, let's start without further ado. And uh, because we have heard uh, the, um, the explanation about uh, the directive and we want to hear your comments on it. First of all, I would like to give the floor to Natalia Ratzak. She is policy uh, officer at the uh, European Transport Federation, ETF, uh, to um, share your views on this. Natalia, you have seven minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, it so far has been really amazing to hear all, all of you. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here. And uh, just one thing, uh, I represent European Transport Workers Federation. So uh, I know that our abbreviation is confusing, ETF, but yes, we represent workers in all transport sectors from uh, urban public transport through uh, railway workers to civil aviation maritime sector. So obviously platform work is uh, really important to us because digitalization and automation is happening in transport sector uh, very rapidly. And basically it's because transport operations are quite easy to standardize and well, you can write an algorithm to manage it, uh, as it is in the case of uh, ride hailing platforms. So uh, here I would just like to talk to you about our general position on, on platform work and also about the sectoral dimension. So how we see it from, uh, let's say, urban mobility uh, approach. And actually, you already said most of the things that I wanted to mention when it comes to our position, uh, because I don't know, yes, I can share the screen. Um, this, is, this, is our fair, uh, this is our manifesto for fair platform work that we published earlier this year. And as you can see, uh, most of the things that you mentioned are here. So I would just like to stress a couple of points. Uh, as it was said by you, uh, we believe that right now platform workers are misclassified. And if only we could enforce uh, the, the legislation, the labor laws, we would already have uh, much fewer problems. Uh, but well, it is not the case as we all know. Uh, so, so yes, so this should be enforced better. And we are not in favor of the third uh, worker status, as uh, Yassine said, as it is the case in the UK, uh, where workers get some rights, but not all of them. And it's uh, for two reasons. One is because we believe that platform workers are not a separate sector. They are not a special group of people. They, they belong to uh, their respective transport sectors, let's say, when we talk about transport. So for example, uh, Uber drivers, they, uh, they are part of the uh, on-demand passenger transport sector. The uh, delivery riders, 
part of logistics. So just creating this subcategory of employees is <laughs> wrong ethically for us. And uh, the other thing is that if we have a third employment status, we can see it spreading to other sectors of transport or yeah, all sectors of economy. So yes, this is definitely something that we don't not want if there is any uh, EU initiative or national uh, legislation. Yes, we are not in favor of that. And as also some of you said, uh, we believe that platform companies need to take responsibility towards uh, society and their workers because at his, at his, as it has been said many times today they will do everything to avoid the laws and we saw that in california with prop 22 they are well, able to spend millions of dollars just to prevent the the laws so uh, yeah so it is unacceptable and uh, and basically we need to uh, make platform companies uh, respect the rules. And we saw some papers that uh, came from platform companies, for example, Uber published their uh, vision for better platform work. And they say that they would like to see all workers independently of their status get social protection, uh, which sounds good. But then the question is who pay for that. And it seems like Uber wants to have a cake and eat a cake, while others will pay for uh, the social protection for, for platform workers. So yes, not in favor of that. Uh, and, and finally, uh, as you also said, the fair digital workplace is really important. Uh, we need to have human control over algorithms. Uh, the workers should have access to their data. A workers' representatives should uh, be able to negotiate algorithms, and uh, also we should have public control over the algorithms. So uh, these are the let's say general uh, general points when it comes to what what the upcoming EU initiative should look like. But I'd also like to cover some sectoral issues because obviously the platform companies, the right hailing apps, they really impacted urban mobility. And we should remember that Uber in their uh, prospectus for the investors, the Uber uh, explicitly mentioned that urban public transport, it's their competitor. So, uh, well, it is <laughs> something that is really dangerous and we need to address that as well. And uh, we see many, initiatives on many new services uh, popping up in mobility uh, services mobility uh, sector so for example we have mobility as a service concept uh, where you have different modes of transport combined in one app and the passenger can choose whichever is more convenient and well it's just uh, easier to move around the city and if we just uh, let platforms be part of uh, this uh, mass services without setting any social criteria, well, then obviously we have uh, unfair competition. So that's something that uh, has to be addressed. And we believe that the way to do it is to impose uh, social criteria uh, or, uh, well, also fiscal criteria that you need to uh, obey the, the fiscal laws, uh, social laws, Otherwise, uh, well, you do not have access to such uh, mass uh, platforms. Uh, same when it comes to carpooling services, uh, which is uh, like between taxi and uh, public transport. Uh, we have we had recently a new law being uh, that was adopted in Germany that for the first time regulated this carpooling services. And uh, the unions wanted to have social criteria introduced. Uh, so, for example, Uber would need to uh, respect them. And in the first draft, there was nothing about that. Uh, fortunately, in the uh, adopted law, there is a provision that uh, the local authorities can introduce uh, social conditions when it comes to uh, tendering uh, such carpooling services which is better than nothing, but it is not obligatory. And um, why I mentioned that is also because uh, when you look at the EU smart and sustainable mobility strategy, 
uh, if I just may have a little bit more, I will finish soon. So if you look at this mobility strategy, uh, you see that there is one uh, planned initiative that uh, aims to assess uh, the need for a new EU uh, legislation uh, on a level playing field between uh, public transport, urban public transport, uh, on-demand uh, passenger services and platforms. And uh, well, you can imagine this initiative going both uh, two ways. Either uh, we uh, say that, well, we open the markets, we remove all the restrictions, and uh, we just basically do the race to the bottom, uh, which is what platforms would like to see, or we raise the standards. And obviously this is what we would like to see. And uh, our position is that, well, you need to have the same conditions, same pay for the same job. And uh, what we definitely don't want to see is this, um, well, fostering of innovation that basically means uh, lowering the standards. And well, obviously we're not against innovation, but that's what somehow uh, we get that under the name of innovation, we get this lowering of social standards and then we're definitely not in favor. And, um, and yeah, so just to maybe finish, uh, I, guess I can just repeat what others say that uh, we need to have strong EU initiative that will bring the standards uh, higher and uh, what we don't need is a weak proposal that will uh, well either not change anything or which is even worse will make it harder for the national governments to to improve the, the conditions at the national level so uh, well so we'll be definitely following the legislative process and we will definitely push for the best outcome for the workers so yeah so thank you for now and uh, yeah i will stay here for your questions Merci beaucoup, Natalia. Uh, thank you very much natalia it was crystal clear including on the powerful tool of a sectorial regulation. Now I would like to give the floor to Ludovic Vick of the uh, of a trade unions representative. He is going to uh, comment on what has been said and uh, explain the expectations for the forthcoming directive. You have the floor for seven minutes. Thank you very much, Odile. And uh, thank you very much for this very interesting webinar. I think that all your testimonies are uh, clearly reflecting the experience of the workers on those uh, platforms, uh, not only uh, for drivers, but uh, everywhere, actually, where um, all those uh, solutions are developing. It is important to work at the European level, level with the uh, ITIC at the European level. Uh, we are acting because the Commission is consulting social partners, employers and uh, trade unions on the uh, potential on the potential directive. The first phase is finished. We have explained our expectations and by the end of June we will uh, enter in the second phase. We will be consulted on the potential content of the directive with uh, trade unions all over Europe, with uh, ETUC, we discussed about our mandate. If we were to enter in debates with employers, but uh, uh, associations of employers are not in favor of that. Um, because obviously a platform do not recognize themselves as employers and therefore they do not belong to the organizations of employers. So uh, they need to be recognized as employers, but I will comment on that later. In recent years, we have observed that platforms did not want to respect their, the right of their workers, and therefore those workers, uh, of more often than not with associations and uh, trade unions, decided to go to court 
There are many uh, judiciary um, um, proceedings, many lawsuits. It goes in the right direction, but it gives a fragmented vision of the situation. Um, we've seen that uh, the situation in Spain um, pushes Spain to adopt the Rider Law that was approved today at the Ministerial Council today. It is a very good first step, but it's not enough. Indeed, it is only uh, dealing with riders and deliverers of uh, food. As uh, Yassine said, in the United Kingdom, uh, there have been developments with Uber drivers. The Supreme Court took a decision. Uber said, I'm going to apply that decision. It does not really do so. But I'm only going to apply that to my Uber drivers, not to Uber Eats. It is a fragmented approach. It is not the right one. We cannot make progress one sector per sector. It's going to take ages. It already took ages for uh, judiciary proceedings to um, give us uh, real progress. And it would take uh, even longer if we do not have a unified approach. Last example, Italy. Some courts gave positive rulings, again for delivery. Platforms had three months to change their model. Very recently, Italian trade unions were able to have a collective bargaining agreement uh, with uh, one platform, but not with Deliveroo and Uber. You cannot wait for those platforms to voluntarily change their model. And therefore, we need a European approach. We have two aims. We want to have rights for workers, uh, platform workers, but also atypical workers, in general, broadly speaking, working on or offline. Uh, workers uh, on platforms do not carry out new forms of work. They are only doing more precarious work higher work and other uh, workers working offline uh, are facing similar situations. You can be a domestic worker, you can be a farming worker, you can also be a zero-hour contract worker, um, be hired for a single, um, um, for a single um, task and work. So we clearly need to make sure that rights are given to different uh, types of workers, atypical workers who do not access, do not have access to collective bargaining and so on and so forth. We need also to take into account uh, digital uh, transformation. We need to make sure that it is compatible with social rights and labor rights. In many sectors, uh, the situation that uh, we see in um, transport is going to uh, spread in different sectors. Many companies are now facing the emergence of apps in cleaning, in uh, pubs, for example, if you need a waiter, you have an app that provides a, a worker for two hours, for example. And for childcare also, it is going to um, develop. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, it is going to be a real danger. Um, employers might be uh, thinking about their needs. Do I really need employees? Or could I rather have a pool of people that I can use, self-employed people, and I'm going to pay them less? Against that backdrop, we need a strong proposal. As Abraham explained, we have the same stance. We need to um, promote uh, wage workers for all platform workers, not only offline, also online. Indeed. Uh, workers uh, that accept translation assignments can be self-employed today. But if you are a platform worker, from one day to another, your conditions, working conditions can change. If you today are a real self-employed, maybe tomorrow it's no longer going to be the case. If the pl platform decides to change, 
it's it might change that uh, promotion of uh, wage workers is going to protect everyone at the end of the day because uh, you will need to prove that you are really a self-employed and uh, therefore uh, we need to um, change the uh, situation the platform will have to prove that what they say actually it has been shown with uh, work inspectorates we need to strengthen them but it's not enough we do we should not wait for work inspectorate to uh, carry out inspections or controls on all the platforms platforms should be forced to prove that whenever they carry out a business on a territory that they have a proper categorization of workers we shouldn't have a control afterwards we all know that uh, public authorities are uh, financially constrained and therefore uh, we are always late uh, platforms are always one step ahead if we change that situation um, we will improve the situation we will be ahead of the platform if they change their model they need to respect the aforementioned criteria this was for the status uh, status of workers. Second big issue, the um, platform uh, situation. What is a platform, whether you're a worker or a self-employed? Is it a company? It is a company that uh, has a business. If you have workers, you are an employer. And the app is not only a technological tool, it has been said, it is also a management tool. And therefore, they are uh, the foremen of the digital work. Euh, c'est exactement la même chose, c'est organiser le travail et de manière encore plus efficace. Euh, donc, de manière encore... Euh, encore... Work is organized in an even more efficient way, a way that optim is optimizing profit. This could actually be beneficial to the workers if uh, the uh, health uh, risks uh, would be taken into account. There are a number of risks and challenges to your health, uh, be it for uh, uh, platform drivers uh, or for... Uh, um, delivering worker, delivery workers, food delivery workers. So apparently I have uh, been already too long uh, and so my time is up. Uh, so uh, regarding the alternate status or the third status, the LMB, I'll be short, I'll be brief. There's a risk at the European level. A number of people uh, say that uh, Independent workers uh, should benefit from uh, social protection and other advantages. But to us, it's impossible to leave aside the uh, status of employee. If you're uh, self-employed, uh, then uh, you actually need to be able to um, contribute to uh, the social benefits, etc. And for collective bargaining, if you're not employee, how are you pr protected? How can you even bargain credibly? A uh, worker who is disconnected can uh, not easily mobilize. So I think that is also key for the future. And now, uh, final words. I'm really coming to the end. Why do we need an action at European level? Well, Spain is opting for one way forward, but still is victim, uh, is subjected to blackmail from the platform. And pl the platform can always say that they're going to go to another country. So to act at a European level will prevent blackmail uh, actions uh, from the platform saying that they will go to a country which is more favorable to their rights. We will, however, be careful about this European initiative, not to be respective in a bad way. That is, it should guarantee a minimum a minimal recognition of rights, but not prevent member states who would like to give uh, better rights to their workers to uh, lower them, because otherwise uh, that could become a problem. So we really need to make sure that collective bargaining is part of the package. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we're not uh, undercutting national legislation and that um, uh, member states can go beyond if they want to, but that they certainly should not reduce the workers' rights as they are. And sorry for having uh, gone over my time for a total of five minutes. Thank you very much, Ludovic. There have been uh, some questions uh, published in the chat. Kim, I'm uh, turning towards you. 
And um, I would very much like to hear the point of view from uh, the European Parliament. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. And you have seven minutes. Thank you so much. And uh, also thanks uh, again to Leila for inviting me to this event. I think it's very important and timely that you've uh, organized this. Um, and um, I mean, we find ourselves quite often shoulder to shoulder in combating against big internet companies that believe that they can make up their own rules. Um, and this is something we need to stop and I'm very happy to have found an ally. Platform work was introduced by companies that found a way to go around labor law in order to get cheap labor. And while the platform companies such as Uber claim that the partners working for them are extremely happy with the flexibility they offer, it was governments that had to step in to provide social protection when the COVID crisis hit and certain types of platform work such as taxi services were decimated. And I think giving the floor directly to the workers is crucial for us to better understand the situation on the ground and take these lessons with us when we are working on legislation. Because believe me, the, comp the corporations know how to find us. Um, and we have heard from, from drivers from all over the world. And I think their stories are all pretty similar. Their short stories show how the business model of Uber and others is in the first place disruptive for the livelihoods of workers and has led to fragmentation of real jobs into separate tasks, abandoning the security and stability a job provides. And this is an evolution on the labor market that cannot be the future model. And that is why we need to regulate this as soon as possible. And there have been several court cases that have already been discussed as well, where drivers have taken Uber to court that are showing us the direct direction we need to go into when regulating platform work. The European Court of Justice has ruled already in 2017 that Uber is a transport company, but Uber still wants us to believe the fairy tale that they're just an online platform connecting offer and demand with no real control over the drivers. And more recent court rulings, of course, against Uber, for instance, by the UK Supreme Court and against Uber and other platform companies in many countries have, however, pointed out clearly that the drivers have to be recognized as employees. And there's one recent court ruling I would like to specifically point out, um, which was the one of last month. Um, in last month, the Amsterdam District Court adopted the landmark ruling that ordered Uber to reinstate six drivers that were automatically fired by an algorithm. I mean, this endless stream of court cases cannot be the way for workers to access their rights. It's costly and time consuming, and it's difficult to beat companies with deep pockets. And that's why we need to step in and regulate based on the outcome of these court cases. And as Leila mentioned, Uber and other platform companies have understood that their sector will be regulated. So they are changing strategy and are going full out to ensure that the rules will be written in such a way that basic principles of labor law are bent to their business model based on exploitation of cheap labor and investment capital instead of playing by the rules. And they have behaved as rogue actors deliberately misclassifying their workers. So we need to be careful not to get tricked by them. And I know Lila and myself won't be, but we need to make sure neither are the European Commission and some of our colleagues in the Parliament. We know the massive lobbying wave has just started in which drivers are often instrumentalized directly through the apps and millions of euros will be spent. And the European Commission has announced that it will present its proposals for platform work rules at the end of this year. And the consultations with the social partners are ongoing and deliberations inside the European Commission are also picking up speed. And in the European Parliament, we are working on the report to provide input to this process and how we will position ourselves as a parliament will be crucial. I think the crucial element in the discussions will, will mainly revolve around the employment status. The shadow rapporteurs of four political groups are already in favor of the rebuttable presumption of employment status that trade unions just now also presented. And this will probably still mean that strategic litigation will happen in coming years, but we are hopeful that platform companies will also themselves eventually choose for the employment model since it will provide stability. And for me, it's quite simple. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's likely a duck. And, for, and um, why would we give workers only some basic rights rather than the full rights of an employee? We will have to see how Ms. Brunet, the report, rapporteur from the Renew Group, will position herself now when we start negotiating in two weeks. I think fixing the employment status will not, however, 
fix all issues related to platform work and some rights need to apply to anyone working through a platform relating to health and safety, the prohibition of non-competition clauses and algorithm management. And it has been brought forward by previous speakers that what differentiates platform work from other jobs is the role of the algorithm in the work management and the constant surveillance. We see that workers' performance is constantly monitored and see surveillance of workers by hybrid real-time identification systems, geolocation checks, and facial recognition. And I believe we need to tackle this issue from both the digital policy as labor rights side. Last month, the European Commission has proposed new rules for ensuring trustworthy AI and has included use of AI in employment and workers' management as one of the high risks areas that will be subject to certification. And I think this is a good step and I'll work to make this provision even stronger. And we also need specific rules on algorithmic management in the future directive on platform work. We need to clearly define data rights for platform workers and ensure transparency of the algorithm, data portability rights, and co-governance of the algorithm. I think it's really important that we nail this legislation. When it comes to the future of work and the future of our social model, this is the first battleground and the outcome will be important for how we will regulate the labor market in the future. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Kim. Alors, je pense uh, Thank you very much, avez... Kim. Thank you very much for giving us uh, this uh, brilliant overview. And I suggest now uh, to open the floor to all the participants in the webinar so that I can uh, take the floor in turns. I see that uh, two questions have been posted uh, in uh, the chat. One of the questions is asking, uh, is talking precisely about the core management of algorithms and the other one is about uh, bargaining protection. Uh, and I see that Tito and Brian are both asking for the floor. So um, why don't we actually, uh, I'll give you the floor, Tito and Brian. And Ariadne, and then uh, there will be time for further questions. Tito, you have the floor. I would ask something more than ask for a question. I would ask for something requested. In this directive, I think that all platforms are going to use all their power for lobbying. They are going just to use all their strength to get what they want. And I think that we have something that they do not have, and it's people in the street, the power of mobilizing people. But this power can only reach something if our representatives in our negotiation do call us and they take us into account. We need to be informed of what's going on continuously. I'm not talking here about political things because I'm sure they will call us at political level. I'm more talking about those who have trade union confederations in Europe, for instance. Please, you as well. I'm saying that I'm in Barcelona and we want to be there. We will stop and block whatever we have to block. And this is something that cannot be controlled. And the political parties at the end of the day are the ones that are going to vote in the parliament. And I think we can pressure them. We can work in our respective member states and we can determine things and balance things on one way or another and try to help workers. I don't know how it works in the parliament at European parliament. I'm not exactly familiar with who thinks what in the middle, right, left wings. Some are supposed to be on the left and we don't know exactly where they are. But I think that this is it. We would like to be informed because we depend on you. You are our voice, the, and that's why these kind of meetings, networks at international level are so important. And we will use all our strength. We have a lot in Catalonia. We are the ones who have a real capacity to be heard and to make the others sit with us. So please call us, count with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tito. I'm taking the floor instead of the, our other participants. Brahim, you have the floor now. Uh, 
Uh, I have a question, or two questions, rather. How about having, how about setting up a compliance authority or regulation authority that would actually check what's going on with the algorithms? I think that uh, at the European Union level, we have the tools, but I can see that uh, Tito has uh, also been. Uh, really smart uh, with uh, reverse engineering. This is something that uh, allows us to, enables us to understand uh, what's being done. Uh, how about doing this at a European level? It is using, uh, in a way, uh, the uh, weapon of the opponent against them. So this uh, reverse engineering would allow us to understand uh, what uh, they are actually doing. And then I'd like also to highlight uh, the importance of what Tito has been saying. Actually, I'm really, really pleased to hear that uh, some uh, of the taxi drivers are saying the same thing in France, uh, but I'd like to hear that more often all over the European Union. And that is the importance of self-regulation. Because I, I think that uh, once we'll have regulation at all levels, uh, we will see uh, positive results. So in order to support this uh, future directive, I think that we need to mobilize uh, wherever it is possible. And we need to mobilize this year. It is really important to uh, put our full strength in the fight. And please, please do it. It's really important to me. Please, let's support collectively this uh, future directive. Uh, let's not be naive. Sometimes I hear that it's uh, not going to uh, serve any uh, to serve any purpose. In France, we have managed to mobilize collectively, and uh, we uh, uh, actually um, barred customers from accessing the headquarters of Uber in France, uh, whatever the weather, for three months without tiring. We actually. Uh, blockaded the headquarters of Uber, and it's of the point. We won. We were visible. Everyone actually knew what was going on, and Uber was calling us over the weekends, which was a really positive sign that they were actually fretting. And suddenly the media took an interest in what we were doing. So no, mobilizing is always good. What I'm saying is that it is indispensable to support this future European directive, uh, thanks to uh, Europe-wide mobilization. We need to make our voices heard. We need to show them that uh, we're here, we're vigilant, and uh, if the directive is not going the way we want it to, that we will mobilize, we will rally forces and take to the streets. So I think that uh, this directive should be an occasion to show uh, where the power dynamics is shifting. So please, please join us. I can tell you that uh, the uh, uh, platform drivers in France will uh, act collectively in support of this future European directive. Thank you. Thank you, Brahim. This was uh, really very, very clear. Yes, so we need to uh, shift uh, the uh, power dynamics uh, ahead of negotiations. Uh, I would uh, suggest to give the floor to Aouya Daye, and then uh, why not give the floor to uh, Natalia and Ludovic. Aouya Daye, you, thank you, very you much. have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, most of the things that people said here today is what has happened to us through in Africa. Uh, I don't want to you know, repeat most of what they have already said, but this European regulation is very important for us in Nigeria and Africa in general, because Uber group us with Europe, which is very, very vital with us. We are waiting for the good regulation from EU so that we can, we can leverage on it in Africa, Nigeria. I want to touch two areas that people are not mentioned, which is very, very important when they want to do this type of regulation. Uh, the number one is audit. Uh, it's because there's no auditing that do audit the system, the platform. That's why you see Allogrim fire people without 
any questions and without any inquiry. It's very important to make sure that the platform and the auditing, this will audit a platform regularly so that they can really know what and what is embedded into their platform. For example, the issue of commission or uh, Uber is taking 25% here in Nigeria, but actual amount of money they are taking is more than 25% when they audit the platform, especially if you check uh, the, the reverse receipts to the customer, which we call rider here in Nigeria. Uh, the second aspect is the issue of taking in drivers um, every minute, every second. Uh, this one cannot help us. Because if you flood our uh, streets of, with many cars, uh, it will reduce the income of uh, many drivers that is operating on that platform. That's why you see that the new driver make money more than the uh, old drivers on their platform. These are the method they use to lure people into the system. I could reconnect in 2014 when Uber established in Lagos. Uh, we make a lot of money by then. Uh, most of us, uh, we, we borrow money from the bank uh, to push car into their platform. But uh, since 2016, that they cut down uh, our income by 40%, which they refused uh, to cut down their own commission 25%. That's the genesis of our problem here in Nigeria concerned to the platform uh, working. So these are the areas that is very, very important uh, if they want to come up with a, a regulation that can be globally um, accepted, especially here in, in Nigeria and Africa in general. Uh, what happened in Nigeria is not different to what happened in Ghana and what happened in Kenya and Uganda and even the South Africa. So the problem are the same. So that's the reason why the global needs to help us, especially Africa. And I will tell you the reason why. The reason why is this, if America can be used, can use $240 million uh, to fight a driver in California uh, because of AB5 against uh, Pro 22, you can imagine what will happen to us here in Africa, in Nigeria, which we are very poor. And if uh, the Uber did not obey the Supreme Court in UK by allow the full implementation of what the the uh, Supreme Court said, you can imagine what will happen to us in Nigeria and in Africa. So what I'm trying to say is that we need um, a global pressure that we mandate all these our companies to bring out whether poorest uh, country or rich country, they should leverage on the system that we are set by all driver globally. For example, the system they are running now is an exploitation uh, methodology of slavery uh, driver partner. And let me start big example. Uh, the traditional way of employment, uh, they provide everything for you, including training. But when you look at the platform work, you go to their platform with your investment. Uh, for example, uh, Uber have 13,000 uh, driver here in, in Lagos alone. And um, the average car you can see on that platform is about 2.5 million Naira. Uh, if you consider, if, 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 if you had those 2.5 million Naira, you multiply it by 13,000 driver. We are talking about billions of Naira that we put into their platform. So automatically they spend nothing. They are just with us on our business. If at all we want to be um, you want to employ us. There's supposed to be a provision that will pro protect our investment on their platform first so that you can be able to sustain and maintain and retain your profits from them. So these are the angles. And I want the global world to really take note of because these are company, they believe they have the power of maneuvering. They have the power of deceptives. They have the power of corny people. For example, what they normally back on is sympathy from the citizen. And the citizen thinks that because 
their platform is cheaper. Uh, it's very easy for them to support them. Not only to them that they are killing their fellow men in the same country. Because if you are a rider, you support uh, what the, the, the platform is doing to your brother, and they see that he's killing your brother every day, you're supposed to support your brother. And that's what really happened in California that make Uber win uh, Pro 22 in California because they deceive people there. So now, if you look at all these issues together, we have one thing. And what is the important thing is that they should mandate that every country that Uber will establish or they have already established, they should follow rule and regulation of that particular country. Here in Nigeria, we have a labor law that states that Ibrahim, ayo aidé, Ibrahim, je suis désolée, je vais être obligée de, de vous interrompre, non pas parce que ce que vous dites est... I'm really sorry, Ibrahim. What you say is truly, truly important, but actually we are starting to run out of time and uh, I will need to be able to uh, give the floor back to uh, the uh, members of uh, the panel to give us a European perspective, uh, Natalia and uh, Ludovic. And we also need to bring this webinar to the close. We... Um, uh, have to finish at 5 p.m. Uh, and so um, I'm sorry to have had to interrupt you, but uh, Natalia, would you like to uh, take the floor maybe? Um, with general remarks or specific question that you would like me to answer. What I would like you to do is to answer the questions that have been uh, uh, posted on the chat and also uh, in the uh, brought up by the different panelists. Um, yeah, so with respect to the uh, unionization and bargaining protections, uh, yes, there is a separate uh, EU initiative. And well, maybe Ludovic can say more about it because ETUC is, has been involved uh, in it uh, more than us. Uh, but in general, yes, I agree uh, what, what uh, was just said that uh, what well, we as a trade union movement workers, we need to also have the passengers, customers on our side uh, because it's true that, well, it's convenient to use Uber. And uh, even last Saturday, uh, I, I was out with, with some friends and it was the first day in Brussels where you could go out again. And I told them that I will speak today about Uber and about the workers' rights. And they were like, yes, yes, very good, very good. It's terrible, Uber is terrible. But later in the evening when, uh, well, it was already late, so uh, buses were not functioning, they were not running that often. They asked me like, oh, so maybe we can uh, call an Uber for you. So, so you see that there is a bit of this uh, disconnect between what people think that they want to believe and what they do really. So it is really important uh, to also have uh, the public on our side uh, and yeah, and, and communicate clearly uh, why Uber is not as cool as, uh, as well, we think. So yeah. Uh, that is from my side. Merci beaucoup, Natalia. Effectivement Thank you very much, Natalia. Yeah, I think that was uh, very clear. Yes, we need to uh, uh, raise the awareness of our users. Ludovic, would you like to react? Pour les, les réactions. Uh, je pense well, thank que you very much for your reactions uh, on the chat and elsewhere. Well, I think that mobilization here is key. That's the only way to uh, shift the power balance. Uh, thanks to our previous mobilizations, uh, the uh, pro Ubers are quiet. I've never seen 2,000 people take to the street in order to uh, uh, fight for Uber and uh, their business model. On the other hand, it is really clear for the European Commission that uh, the uh, narrative that for the European Commission, it is important to show that the narrative is that uh, we make our voices heard everywhere, that there are uh, actions all over the place. Uh, and I think that a number of um, stakeholders have mentioned uh, the work done by the judiciary. I think that in France, Ibrahim said that uh, there was some ambiguity, some leeway, but uh, to be honest, if you look uh, at uh, law case in general, it is 
pointing in one direction and one only. So I think that we need to clarify by taking uh, cases to the courts. And not only is it important to have a new directive, but uh, the enforcement will be key. I think that uh, there will be uh, the proposal of the Commission, there will be the work of the European Parliament, but in the end, the final position uh, will be what will be discussed within the Council of the European Union. We know that the Member States uh, are usually uh, shooting down uh, every ambitious project uh, during the discussions at the Council, and there you have access, you, have, you need to lobby to advocate with your governments, and I think that uh, transnational mobilization is great, but national mobilization remains important because this is how you're going to be able to talk to your governments and to mobilize them to explain why this is important. We need to be also very vigilant regarding the uh, enforcement. If we look at Spain, uh, who now has our food delivery uh, app, who now needs uh, to uh, uh, treat his employees as employees, we can imagine uh, that uh, it could be easily bypassed by, for example, hiring uh, temp workers through an agency. So uh, you just uh, hire workers through a temp agency. So there's always a way out. So we will need to close those loopholes. We will uh, need to apply pressure to the platforms, but also to apply pressure to make sure that the law is correctly enforced where uh, all over in every member state. And I think that uh, an interesting idea that has been brought up uh, at the beginning of the discussion is what's being done in Barcelona. In Barcelona, uh, there is a, a taxi app that is uh, preventing Uber from developing because there is no space for that. And so uh, what we need also is a thinking about public service, public transport. Transport since the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of money has been given to all companies uh, in order to help them survive. But uh, a little thought seems to have been uh, devoted to see what could be developed. I think that um, in the cities where, for example, uh, delivery services have stopped, etc., it would be interesting to think how can we set up. Uh, together with workers, uh, a new delivery service, something that is more sustainable for the future with workers who are correctly, who are paid a decent wage. I think that to think in terms of public service is maybe also an interesting approach, something that is much better than to give uh, thousands uh, and hundreds and thousands of euros to companies to help them survive. So I think that uh, local authorities, uh, town hall authorities here have, have a responsibility in order to uh, prevent the digitalization of the economy and support stakeholders of the future. Yes, thank you very much. Ludovic, Kim, you now have the floor. I am very uh, uh, curious to hear what you have to say. And then uh, Brian and Leila, I'm going to give you the floor for the conclusion. There is a uh, little time left, seven minutes in total. So, Kim, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'll try to keep it, uh, I'll keep it short. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I think uh, we have heard many things today and um, I think it's very interesting what has been said. Um, I think um, also um, the the input, you know, from people outside the EU was really relevant. Um, I feel even more pressure now to really nail this directive to make sure it's it it also becomes an example for for you know the worldwide um, uh, rules that are coming up and hopefully you know a big transformation just on on uh, the way these um, companies actually deal with their workers. Um, I think it is. Um, very important that um, when we are discussing, you know, just going into the, some of the questions that were asked in the chat, when we're talking about, you know, bargaining, bargaining for self-employed workers, um, I think it's very important that we do not confuse this with um, bargaining for uh, bogus self-employed workers. If people actually should be just uh, uh, labeled as employees, then they, you know, can be covered by trade unions. Uh, we have the systems in place. We don't need a different system for for bogus self-employed people. We just have to make sure they are categorized as workers. Um, and when when talking about, you know, a bit more about you know, the real digital aspect. I indeed think that if we're talking about our public infrastructure, we really have to look also at our digital infrastructure, the way we deal with that, um, and ensuring that you know that um, we are not just um, 
uh, bedazzled by the beautiful stories about algorithms and you know online and apps and how that is completely different we have to you know just try to strip away all the um, digital bedazzlement and just look at what is at stake here and what is at stake here is the health and safety and social protection of people that are working really hard to bring people from place A to place B and um, that has to stop so um, that's what we are going to focus on and, um, and uh, I'm uh, very glad to have heard uh, all of your perspectives and I'm looking forward to continue cooperating with you. Thank you very much, Kim, I, Ibrahim and Leila. Maybe you could conclude the meeting, Ibrahim, and then Leila. Very quickly at that. Well, we'll do the opposite. Actually, I will start very quickly. We need to finish at 5 p.m. sharp. Thank you. Thank you ever so much to all of you for those discussions. It has been enriching the first part with the stakeholders from the European Union and the exchanges with the workers from all around the world. What's really striking to me when I discuss with workers, um, and uh, let's not forget that uh, we are all in different time zones. We all speak different languages, but we have the same observations. We talk about the same problems. We crave for respect. We want platform to respect us. And all of that highlighted in all work the need. Um, and it will be uh, in that directive. Um, so we will need to impose limits to make sure that they respect the law, that there is a framework. So clearly, this is a be within all of that and clearly there is also um, a clear relationship and uh, um, we need to tilt the balance in favor of workers and we wanted through this webinar uh, influence the situation as tito and uh, brahim said you uh, mentioned the importance of mobilization it is going to help us, Kim and I, in our daily work at the European Parliament, because you brought us a lot of expertise. You gave us the, uh, you highlighted the importance of power relationship. It helps us when we meet the commissioner in charge of employment and social affairs. And when I tell them that I was at an event with drivers in front of the representation of the European Union in Paris, or three months ago, I organized a webinar with workers from all over the world. It's more powerful than if we say, well, we decided, we think uh, ourselves that this would be relevant. And then Tito, at the beginning of the webinar, you said that if we keep working out, uh, working together, we are going to create real problems to the platforms. And I do hope that we will work together, that the whole victims of uberizations, workers, deliverers, drivers, and taxi drivers, victims of uberization will work together. Count on us, we will be by your side with all the different stakeholders. And I stop here, I give the floor to uh, Brahim. I would like to thank Odil for her moderation. I stop here and I give the floor to Brahim. Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank uh, the uh, MEP Leila Shabi Odil Shani for her excellent work in moderating this meeting, which was a clear success. I do thank you because uh, uh, without you, we wouldn't have had such a lovely and wonderful webinar. And we need to uh, continue exchanging together. We need to keep on working together. This is the first step in a very long road. We need to uh, make sure that we can unite, combine our forces to make sure that this European directive is a success. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. And this was the conclusion. I don't know who is closing the webinar. I cannot do that. 
I thank you and the interpreters also thank all of you for your trust. Goodbye.